Take your Bibles tonight, Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 25 tonight. If you want to use the Bible in the peel, it'll be page 847. I'm sure glad you're here back at church tonight. I love coming to First Baptist Church. I love coming to church. Church is not a chore. Church is a privilege. There are people around the world who would give anything to gather like we've gathered here tonight. I appreciate you being back tonight. I don't take it for granted. As you know, we have church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and midweek service. And you know, I don't browbeat you into coming. I just try to instruct you that the Bible wants us to meet together and try to make it profitable. I try to do my part in studying. We try to be music that will uplift the Lord. And then I believe the Lord has used services. He used Sunday morning. He used Sunday night. He uses Wednesday. He uses all of them. I feel bad for those places that only have one service a week. They don't get to gather like we gather, to fellowship. You don't get to hear all the gossip you get to hear when you come to church three times a week. The blessings come to church and, and to uplift each other. I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Isaiah chapter 25, we're going to jump right into our text in just a moment because it's a, it's a rich text tonight. A beautiful, beautiful uh, passage of Scripture. Tonight, we're going to see the, the very essence of God's character revealed. And the structure of this chapter is different than in some of the other chapters. Tonight, what we'll find, the structure of this chapter, is that Isaiah, in verse number one, will make a declaration, a very powerful declaration, and then he will support it throughout the chapter. Now, Scripture is structured very differently throughout the pages of, of our Bible. There are times that the Bible will give warnings and exhortations. There are times that the Bible merely reports what happened in a situation without weighing this was good or bad, just this is what happened. It expects us to synthesize that with the rest of Scripture to know that, yes, when this man told a lie, it was wrong because God says that lying is wrong, and, and when this happened, it was good or bad based on Scripture. Other times, uh, Scripture is filled with encouragement, with, with, with wonderful promises that just touch us on an intimate level. We walk away warm and glowing because of God's wonderful promises. And sometimes, like tonight, we see powerful declarations of God's character, of his being, of his actions and his work. And for that, we can say a hearty amen. Because our God is truly unmatched. The design of Isaiah 25 is masterful. It begins, and we'll look at Mona and edit with a bold statement that I believe will resonate deeply. No matter if you've been saved for 50 years, for five years. The statement will pass in the echoes of time and reinforce in our hearts of who God is. Because everyone in this building, everyone in the sound of my voice, every living person yearns or there's something inside them that has a God void. Romans chapter 1 teaches us this. Some embrace that and seek after God. Others reject it and say, I don't want anything to do with him. But even then, Romans 1 tells us that everyone has been lit, has the light inside of them. And we know that people understand, society understands, they're not the biggest thing in the universe. For some, they think it's aliens, that the aliens are bigger than we are. The Bible tells us there's no aliens. If you're waiting for them, I'm sorry. I'm waiting for Jesus, not aliens. For others, it's the earth. The earth is the biggest thing in their universe. We must preserve. In fact, I read uh, yesterday, uh, one organization that loves the earth uh, says that in order to preserve the earth, we must stop eating meat. And that if you, if you pass on one burger a week, it's the same as driving 300 miles less in a week. It's not accurate. It's, I don't think it's to be true. The, the, the facts are skewed. But, but they, their, their biggest God is this is planet earth i'm glad that that my god is bigger than planet earth i, I love the majestic rockies i love the, the beauty of this world and the wonder of it but this didn't take god very long to create so tonight let's look at this statement explore the declaration and the truth god has for us isaiah chapter 25 we will read at first just the first verse. O Lord, thou art my, what word? God. I will, what does it say? Exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou 
hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are, and there's two words here, faithfulness and truth. Now, when they structured the songs for tonight, they did not realize where I was going tonight with the sermon. This is just the Lord's working. This is not man's. Now, I would not be afraid to structure it that way if we needed to, to reinforce something. But we didn't. All right, we didn't. So Brother Dalton just sang a whole song on our Redeemer's faithful and true, right? Whole thing about that. And we come to our passage tonight, and what do we find out that God is? Faithfulness and truth. And yet we sit here at times unmoved by that. Shame on us. But this verse calls us to be moved. So with Lord's help, we're going to unpack this verse throughout this chapter, and I believe it will touch us, and Lord willing, with his grace, changes tonight. Lord, we love you. Lord, we lift you up tonight. I ask for your help during this sermon. You would be lifted up. You'd be high and mighty. Lord, I pray that this portion of Scripture would not just fall upon ears, but fall upon hearts tonight. And that your spirit would touch us, that that nothing would hinder the truth that we find here in Isaiah chapter 25. And Lord, that as you touch us, that we would be changed, that we'd respond to you. Lord, our hearts become cold, they become calloused, Lord, they become crusty. Lord, tonight I pray, Lord, that you would just move us tonight. Lord, you meet with us, we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, I want you to draw your attention to verse number one. We'll support it with some other verses in the chapter. But truly, our text is almost found entirely inside of verse number one. It begins with a statement, but it's a few different parts of this statement. And we can go no further than the first, the first five or five or six words, where Isaiah says this, almost in a contemplation taking maybe a moment aside from the prophecies that he's been given, he takes a moment to praise and he says, O Lord, thou art my God. In this statement, this initial statement, is wrapped up so much truth and so much, uh, such a, a challenge for you and for I. He begins with this, O Lord. There, that Lord in your Bible, you'll see it in many of your Bibles, in all caps, L-O-R-D. When you see that in your Bible, almost always it is referring to the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh, the self-existing one. This is the name that God named himself with. This was not man's creation. This was first revealed at the burning bush when Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? And God answers back, Yahweh, Jehovah. I am that I am. It was the first time that this name had been revealed in Scripture. Before that, they knew him as Elohim, God. They did not know his name. And God revealed his name, the self-existing one, the one who has no beginning and no ending, the one who no one started. He literally self-existed, who needs no support in life, who does not need anything from us, that is the one that the writer Isaiah says, O Lord, Jehovah, I am making you my Elohim, my God. There are so many things that want to be God in your life and in my life. We have the God of our own logic and thoughts. And we elevate our logic and our thoughts over Jehovah. And we say, in essence, how we live, O logic, my logic, thou art my God. And that's how we live our life, making decisions and choices, operating in our own thoughts. And while we would shudder to raise up a Buddha or a Baal over God, we will quickly and consistently raise up ourselves. There are those who raise up money over God. Say, how can that be? Remember when I was a youth pastor? It was a young teenage girl. She said, Pastor J.D., I can't come to church Wednesday nights anymore. I said, why is that? She goes, I got a job at McDonald's. She goes, I have to work Wednesday nights. Now, she was not supporting a family. She was not on her career. She was merely working 
for a minimum wage at that time of seven and a quarter an hour at McDonald's. I asked her, how many hours did you put on last Wednesday? She said, three hours. I said, wow. I said, your God is worth about $17. Because you made 21, a little over 21, and after taxes in the great state of Michigan, in the great country of the USA, you walked home with about 16 to $17. So your God is worth $17. How much is your God worth? How much is your God worth? What will keep you away from worshiping God? Now, I'm not trying to browbeat you into coming to church, my friends. I'm just trying to, to, to explain to you, let you see how much is your God worth? What will keep you away from God? We read in the New Testament and the Old Testament of those who suffered for Jesus Christ, who suffered for God. Their God was worth their life. And for some people, their God's not worth more than 50 bucks. Isaiah begins, O oh Lord, Jehovah, thou art my Elohim. You're my God. You're my sovereignty. You are worthy. He goes on, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. I love how the Bible describes events and actions. And here the Bible chooses wonderful. What God does is wonderful. In the hard times, what God does is still wonderful. In the good times, what God does is wonderful because God is wonderful. He was on to say this, thy counsels of, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Everything else in this chapter we will kind of, we'll find come, comes back to this concept that who God is, what he does, is faithful and true. That word faithful has the idea of stability and security. Or we could say it this way, that God is a God, number one, of strength. How strong is God? Answer, how strong is God? Help me, how strong is he? Well, what, naturally, you have to ask, well, well, how do we define his strength? How much could God bench press? Yes. How much could God lift? Well, well Pastor, there's, there's no way to answer that question. So how strong is God? Well, what, what can he do? Anything. We look in terms of our own limited capabilities and our own frailty. You see, a car that's in the, in the way, most of us cannot lift that car out of the way. We can't do it. God, he hangs the world on nothing. He's a God of strength. We are locked up in his faithfulness. We're locked up tight with God. Why is this a big deal? Because in a world that is tossed and turned, God is not. Look no further than the, than the coming election. This, this country is tossed and turned. Outside the country, nation against nation, people against people. There are, are cultures that are fighting other cultures. There is calamity. There is famine. There are problems. There are wars. In a place of, of tossing and turning and, and tumult and chaos, God is not. He's a God of strength. In a place where trust is often put in man's, creations. Well, we can trust God. We trust man's creations all of the time. You're sitting in man's creation. You will drive home in man's creation. You will lay your head down on man's creation inside of man's creation. Most of you or many of you will go to work tomorrow inside of man's creation, trusting to be, have your needs supplied by man's creation and you'll take it to another building of man's creation and, and give them man's creation to hold on to you so when you need more of man's creation to go buy some of man's creation, you can then live more inside of man's creation. We live in a place where we often have to trust man's creation. But yet our trust cannot come just in man's creation. We have to trust in God, Jehovah, God's strength. A place where sin is polluted and shown to be frail, God is not. 
God is not frail. Look at verse number four. We find the support for this. For thou hast been a what? Strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Do you know where we find where we ought to find our strength? And the one who is faithful and true. And the one who offers true strength and true security. 1938 was a year that Superman was introduced to the world. Comic book. The story was told of a boy from another planet who landed on earth and soon could do the impossible faster than a speeding train or a speeding bullet, right? Stop a train. Obviously, didn't read a lot of Superman. Superman was a force for good, but he was not completely indestructible. He had a weakness. Was it a weakness? Oh, you know about Superman, don't you? <laughs> a bunch of pagans. Didn't he wear like a, like a black cape? Oh, it wasn't a black cape. Oh, okay. People follow Superman more than God. Superman, a little kryptonite, and Lex Luthor, he's in trouble. God's never in trouble, is he? There is no kryptonite with God. You can't stop him. You can't hinder him. You cannot cease from the strength of God. He is the source of strength. When the Golden Gate Bridge was being built, early on in the operation, 23 workers fell to their death in the San Francisco Bay. Shortly after that, they put the city, erected huge nets under the bridge to catch the falling workers and to keep them alive. Once they put the nets down, only a handful fell, just a few. None of them lost their lives. And they say that once the nets went in, the work was in completed in record time. They studied why or what happened, like why the nets made such a difference. And what they came out with was this, that once the nets were in place, the workers could focus on the task at hand and quit worrying about survival. Can you see the connection, friend? Once we understand of the security that is in place, who our strength is, we can quit worrying about surviving and focus on the task at hand. God is our strength. He's faithful. Not only in God's faithfulness do we see strength, but in God's faithfulness we see blessings. Why is this important? Because we live in a society where blessings are temporary. The new car smell wears off. The honeymoon period ends. Things that were bright and shining, functioning well, wear down and break. In a place where pleasure is for a season, the faithful one provides eternal blessings. And in an environment where everything has been touched by sin, God shows blessing in holiness and purity. Look, please, in verse number 6. When the Bible says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. Well, the Bible, what Isaiah is talking about, is a future time when God's blessings will be fully realized. Isaiah is praising God, praising his blessings, not having experienced all of them yet. You and I have not experienced all of God's blessings yet. We've experienced many blessings. 
We are blessed people. We are blessed. We, we could spend the rest of tonight and this week talking about the blessings of God. As we come into November, we'll take some time to praise and to be thankful, and we ought to. But my friends, the list is endless of the blessings of God from, the, from our families, from our jobs, from what we have been given, from material things to strength, to answers to prayer, to a country we can be in to worship freely, to the Word of God written down in our language. The blessings are, are, are countless. And yet we've not seen all of them yet. We serve a God. We, we have a God who has even more blessings and eternal blessings for His children. This is the God we praise. He goes above and beyond our expectations. And we are easily pleased. There's a store in Saginaw called, Runner, called Runners. If you were to go there, and I've sent some of you there to buy a pair of running shoes, they will go above and beyond as they sell you shoes. The owner is a friend of mine. He's been to church here. If you need shoes, a shameless plug, you should buy shoes from him. He's, he does a good job. First time I went there, I sat down, and they said, let's have your, your shoes, and they untied my shoes for me. They took my shoes off my feet. They then brought me other shoes to try. They put those shoes on my feet, and then they tied them for me. I get used to this. Honey, you taking notes? No, 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 I'm just kidding, just kidding. They then stood behind those shoes and said, if you don't like them, you have to 30 days to bring them back, and it, sometimes I've taken advantage of that. I talked to the owner, and I asked him, uh, when I first met him, I said, why do you tie the shoes? I'm not complaining. I like it. He said, let me tell you why. If you were to ask him, he'd tell you the same thing. Bill would tell you the same thing. He goes, my grandmother always said, do a little extra for people and they won't forget it. And he said, so I've challenged my employees and we've made it a part of our store that we'll do a little bit extra and people will remember it. Now, in the service department, I think you'd all agree that that is a true statement. If you go to a restaurant and they do a little bit extra, if you ever get an extra McNugget at McDonald's, you're like, oh my goodness, I ordered six and I got seven. You think, what a great day. Maybe they made a mistake, maybe they didn't, but you're not complaining. If they give you one, two, too few, right? If they miss one, oh boy, you're back in the drive through line. You know, you missed a nugget. You know, one too many, hey, I want to... But my friends, we serve a God who goes, who goes above and beyond. He doesn't just tie our shoes, little things like that. He blesses us way beyond what we could even expect. Discovery of penicillin. Penicillin was a great day for the medical world. Saved countless lives. The men who recognized the potential won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1945. Do you know that before penicillin, there was a way that we fought off diseases. Do you know this? It's called our white blood cells. Do you know this? That God made us to fight off diseases. Did you know that? And while we will praise penicillin, and it's been a help to many people, no doubt about this, how many people have been saved by their white blood cells? Could we even count that? And, and, and then and, and, and two men discover penicillin and we're like, oh, peace prize for you. You've saved countless lives and literally the God of the universe has saved billions of people. Silent blessings that oftentimes we don't even know about. I know we'll get to heaven and we're going to see all of the things that God has done in our life. And we won't be able to help but drop down and worship him. We see his strength, we see his blessings, but in God's faithfulness we see deliverance. Look at verses 8 and 9. He, that is God, will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Those two phrases, they, they sound familiar. You ever heard of those things before, wipe away all tears? Maybe you've read that in Revelation. Maybe you've, you've read that phrase, he will swallow up death in victory, when you find it in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken him. You see, in God's faithfulness, we see his strength, we see his blessings, and we see his deliverance. Why is this important? 
Because my friends, in life we need God's strength. In life we need God's blessings, and in life we need God's deliverance. We don't have to live in defeat. We don't have to live under bondage to anything. Because of God, because of Jehovah, we have deliverance. And one day we'll have ultimate deliverance when death is swallowed up in victory, when God will wipe away all tears from the eyes. That's the moment of ultimate deliverance. But along the way, God brings deliverance if, if we rest in him, if we trust in him and cling to him. And so here's the response back to verse number one. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. The structure of this verse is to give us the faithfulness and truth of God and support it. And I would challenge us this way tonight, that the structure of our life ought to be to make the declaration of Jehovah being our God and then living a life that supports it. That the structure of this chapter ought to mimic, or we ought to mimic in our life the structure of this chapter. Not only does the writer exalt God, he describes it. Not only should we exalt God, but we must then live it. John the Baptist said this, he must increase, but I must decrease. The challenge is tonight to truly look at if your life is a life that praises God and exalts God. Perhaps your mouth praises God, but maybe your life doesn't match it up. Praising God is not just what happens on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening. It's not just singing a song or two or lifting an arm or saying amen. It is not just saying glory to God in the highest, but it is having a life that lives in a way that reinforces what I'm saying I believe. So if my life is filled with worry and concern, I am not praising the God of strength. If I'm bound in indecision, I'm not praising the God of strength. And so if I claim to have Jehovah as my God, the God of strength who's faithful and true, then worry gets a back seat. Concern gets a back seat. In fact, when the disciples were concerned and worried, Jesus did not say, I'm glad you're worried. He said, O ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Another time, he said, you mistake, disciples, because you forgot about the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. You see, concern and worry and panic all are contrary to praising the God of strength. And I can't just say Jehovah's my God if I live my life this way. But it goes deeper. A faithful God's God of blessing. Right? You agree with me before? You still agree with me? God's God of blessing? You say, Pastor, are you setting us up for something? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. So if God is a God of blessing, and I'm to praise a God of blessing, if my life is full of criticism, ungratefulness, and complaints, I'm not praising the God of blessing. O oh Lord, thou art my God. And then he supports it. And if Jehovah is my God, then the criticisms, the complaints... The woe is me. The comparisons, looking around, why is that person blessed more than I am? Why do they get that and I don't get that? And their prayers are answered and mine not. Well, when I begin to complain and criticize and I'm grateful, I am not living like God is faithful and true. I'm living as if he's not the God of blessings. He's a God of strength the God of blessing, the God of deliverance, right? Yeah. So if I'm living in defeat, if I'm living in defeat, then he's not the God of deliverance in my life. 
because he's the God that promises to deliver. We find these themes throughout Scripture. Ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. So is my life, is it structured like Isaiah 25? Where I can make this statement, O Lord, thou art my God. And then I live a life that actually echoes that. Where in my life I find strength I need day by day from God. Not from my own thoughts and logic, but from God. If I make this statement, oh Lord, thou art my God, and I find on my lips there's praise for whatever happens. Lord, you put the slowest driver in front of me. Praise the Lord. Lord, they forgot 15 nuggets in this order, and I only ordered three. Praise the Lord. Lord, that bonus from work was a blessing. Praise the Lord. Am I living a life this way? Lord, you are my God. I need you right here because in my life I'm facing defeat. But I claim you for deliverance. Does my life mimic that? Or is it different? Both cannot happen. Either God is increasing and I'm decreasing, or I'm increasing and God is decreasing. And John said, He must increase, but I must decrease. But I left out one word tonight. I haven't talked much about it at all. Verse number one, if you could, one more time as we close tonight. Because Isaiah 25, one says this. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness. What's the last word? Truth. You don't know this, but you know Hebrew. You know this word. In Hebrew, if we were to pronounce it that way, it'd be a Men. Amen. It means it is certain. And by the way, God is faithful. Amen. Amen. God is strength. Amen. God is a blessing. Amen. God is a deliverer. Amen. He's the victor. Amen. He is supreme. He is God. He is the amen. In fact, Revelation says this, and under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. It's a blessing to come to church and hear good music. We can echo the sentiments with a simple amen. And you thought the beginning of that sermon was merely random. But it wasn't. Because even in the essence of affirming the character of God, we begin to echo the truth in this chapter. When we say amen, we affirm, yes, God, that's who you are. Yes, God, I agree, it is certain. So tonight, praise the Lord. Exalt him. He is faithful. Amen. But does your life reflect that exaltation? Is your life structured like this chapter, full of supporting material, full of statements that support the declaration, O Jehovah, O Yahweh, thou art my God? Or is your life filled with worry, concern, and fear? Is your life filled with criticism and complaints and ungratefulness and defeat? The challenge tonight is to praise the Lord. He's faithful.